After an accident, minutes matter. Your words and actions matter even more. You need help, and you need it now. This is David vs. Goliath, brought to you by Dolman Law Group Accident Injury Lawyers, a boutique firm with a reputation for going head-to-head -head with the insurance company giants and putting people over profits. Welcome to another episode of the David and Goliath podcast. I'm here with my partner in crime, business partner, Stan Geip. Stan, we're going to discuss today the uh, probably the newest emerging mass tort out there. It's pretty close to becoming an MDL, and we'll explain what that is, in Suboxone. And it's more the Suboxone sublingual form that is causing a tooth decay. Do you want to let our listeners know what this is and what we are getting into now? Yeah, and I'm going to tell you, most listeners are probably thinking the same thing I was when you first told me about this case. I'm, I'm sitting there mm -hmm. going, well, it's tooth decay for people who are known to use drugs. Don't those two go hand in hand, right? What, what's the marriage to this lawsuit? It takes a little bit till you get, you, you got to look deeper. Uh, you know, for someone like me who's not really familiar with the different types of drugs, okay? Suboxone, right? This is a drug to help people get off of opiates. It's, it's mm -hmm. prescribed to people who use opiates, and it helps withdrawal symptoms, uh, you know, helps them get to a clean state. Sure. Right? It's not used for methamphetamines. It's not used for that class of drugs. It's primarily for people who are addicted to opiates. Correct. Right? And you go. Sorry. And I was going to say, opiate use is not necessarily closely associated with tooth decay like methamphetamine use. Right? And we, we're familiar with the term meth mouth. Right? And, and we sure. kind of expect that opiates and opium use, opium derivative uses, don't really have that same effect on mouth. So when I looked into it, I was like, holy, holy crap, Matt's right. You know, there really is something to this, right? There's, there's studies out there. And yeah, I don't know if you're familiar with the studies bef before we got into this, but, you know, it was, it was right around 2022 that they started doing some studies and realized that people who are taking these Suboxone strips the, the sublingual, it dissolves under their tongue, were having tooth decay, gum disease, tooth loss, cavities at a much higher rate than the public as a whole. And it, was, sure. it wasn't attributable to their drug use. Turns out it looks like it's attributable to the use of the Suboxone itself. And I think you had a little bit more details you shared with me about, you know, the mechanism yeah, I mean, on the, how the that works. The studies go back actually a few years, but this is the first time, I wouldn't say the first time, it's one of the first times, in, especially in recent memory, that we're looking at a uh, prescription drug where the FDA changed a warning label, not based on scientific studies, actually. It's based on adverse event reports and the amount of reports that are coming out from users of uh, advanced tooth decay, tooth degradation, um, gum disease, gum infections. It's so acidic that it destroys the enamel in the tooth. And we're not sure what the long-term effects are on the gum, but based on adverse event reports, based on anecdotal evidence, we're seeing that it has similar effects on the gum. And this one's common sense when you explain it. Like, mm -hmm. you know, Suboxone had been around for a long time. And the theory sure. is that, hey, as Suboxone is starting to come off of patent, you know, Suboxone's maker is going, oh, how do we keep people using our product versus going to the generic? So they sure. created a different delivery method. And there are these strips that dissolve under the tongue. It gets the medicine into the system quicker, argument that it could be more effective, that may or may not be true. But either way, that was what was pushed out there in the sales pitch. And it, and it sounds good, right? It dissolves. It gets into your system quicker. We all know that, sublingual strip. And it's just, it's such common sense once you said it that, yeah, but this is an acidic product, right? If you're dropping a sublingual strip, you're basically dissolving that acid right onto your teeth. Correct. Right? And NVIDIA is a bad actor. So NVIDIA is the manufacturer, NVIDIA Inc. is the manufacturer of uh, Suboxin. They knew that their patent was running out. They were going to face generic competition for the tablet form of this drug. They, we think... And we believe, and we were going to allege in our lawsuits, and so is the plaintiff bar and the plaintiff steering committee inevitably, will allege that they rushed this product to market without doing the proper studies. And um, proof's in the pudding. Evidence is there that this is so acidic to the teeth, to the enamel itself, that it's causing a whole host of issues that the the solution is actually, um, it's, it's worse than the original problem. Where is this going? We don't know. 
But we're seeing now a host of lawsuits that are coming out, filed in federal law, federal courts throughout the country. And for those listeners who don't really understand the difference between a class action versus a mass tort, and I know Stan's got a thought here, but I'll, and I'll be quick. The class action, think of like your Dell laptop battery. Everyone has the same exact defect or issue that they're dealing with, okay? Or same damages. In a mass tort context, think of like Camp Lejeune water contamination or AFFF firefighting foam or Zantac. I mean, we've seen a whole host of mass torts that have come out over the years. And where this is different than a class action is everyone has different issues, maybe different types of cancers, whether it was Camp Lejeune or you know whatever the whatever the toxin was, it caused not only different issues, but different severities of that issue. So not everyone has the same exact problem. Commonality is what gives you a uh, class action. Mass tort is different where everyone has different injuries. So this is becoming a MDL. Right now, there's lawsuits filed all throughout the country, different federal courts, and there's a hearing on January 25th in Santa Barbara, California for the Joint Panel of Multidistrict Litigation. And this looks like this is going to become an MDL, Multidistrict Litigation. And we're looking at the Northern District of Ohio is where it likely is going to be we're going to end up where they're going to consolidate all the lawsuits before one judge, but we don't know that yet. Now, and going back, looking at the damages, at first blush, okay, you think mm-hmm. tooth decay. Well, well, everyone mm-hmm. has dealt with that. It's rare that you find someone that makes it to adulthood without filling a cavity. Right? Yep. It, uh, there's all kinds of different things, but there's also different levels of tooth decay, different levels of disease. And then this is a really disparate impact based on your socioeconomic profile, right? Matt, you and I are attorneys. We've been practicing attorneys. Without discussing what we make, if you had a problem with your tooth, if all of them fell out, you've got the financial resources to go to a doctor, have something done about it, have teeth replaced, as would I, and Mm -hmm. our outward appearance to the world would be the same, right? When you got someone who's recovering from drug addiction, these are typically people looking for jobs, struggling to find jobs, etc. Part of what makes your first impression is your appearance, right? So now you've got people who are already struggling to get back on their feet. They've got sure. to deal with degraded teeth and almost the association, the subconscious association some people have with that's drug use. That's meth mouth. That's a drug mouth, right? And this is what these people are dealing with. And it's not due to that. It's, it's due to the fact that they've gone out of their way to get off of these drugs. And now it's given them appearance of almost being back on drugs. It's, it's a horrible effect for these people. Yeah, it's inhibiting their ability to gain employment. Uh, among Forget numbers. about their own personal lives. And I mean, there's a, it's a cataclysmic effect that it has on an individual. It it's gains employment, but then there's also... These are people who are known already to struggle with self-esteem issues, with things like that. And suddenly, now you can't even open your mouth. Your teeth make you look bad. It's like just another hit. It's another hit on these people that they don't need. So when I looked into this, you know, my my initial thought that this was a must-be-frivolous, there must not be much to it, I looked into it, and I'm like, (coughs) well, there really is something to it. The government's already got on them from doing it. And look, these these people really do have real problems as a result of it. You know, I go first up on I was gonna say, no, I've looked out there and you know, from what I'm seeing, you know, I see people placing cl- values on these claims anywhere from fifty to one hundred and fifty thousand dollars estimated depend on what's going on. Yeah, way too early to start estimating that. You'll see that often in blogs and the internet for people looking to gain search engine traffic. I mean, the cases are in their infancy. Uh, do I think they will have a fruitful outcome? I do. Unlike most mass torts, the science here uh, does not seem very difficult to prove up. Based on the anecdotal evidence, the adverse event reports, and we know how acidic that this product is, I don't think we need a lot of epidemiological data. I think it's going to come down to more of proof of usage, dental records. Did the Suboxone actually cause the issue or did it have underlying dental issues beforehand? And just the... Uh, the demographic of clients make this a little bit more difficult of a mass tort. These are, you know, obstacles we can't overcome. But I think those are the bigger issues rather than the actual underlying science in this mass tort. So, you know, this podcast could be for any one of a number of audiences. But if anyone's listening to us that actually is a Suboxone user, an ex-Suboxone user, just real mm-hmm. quick, you want to go over what they would need to know to find out if they qualify to be a part of this? Sure, Stan, go through it. it. Okay, so my understanding is we've got a cutoff right around the beginning of 2022. Okay, this Correct. is when 
the, the government essentially forced the warnings to be provided to users. All right. And yeah, the black box warning level was changed in 2022. Right. So before that, there was no warning. People didn't know. So what you've got to do is you've got to show, what, six months of use of these Suboxone strips? Correct. That would be considered long-term use. Over Correct. what period of time? And, you know, and that's where this is early. And this is going to change because, again, a plaintiff steering committee has not been created. And we saw this with, um, you know, chemical hair straighteners, for instance. Um, we know that uh, leads to a whole host of cancers and reproductive cancers for women. In the very beginning, they were taking on cases that involved fibroids. And I don't want to get off topic here, but then they changed that multiple times as the science began to get whittled down. And they formed their steering committee and everyone got on the same page. So it's a little bit early. Um, we're looking at any case, any claim before 2022. Uh, where there was long-term usage, and it resulted in, um, an, I would say, a negative outcome in terms of tooth loss, tooth degradation, broken teeth, uh, gum disease, and so on and so forth. We're looking at any type of dental issue as a result of Suboxone use. I don't want to limit it yet, and I, you know, this will obviously, this this podcast will still be in existence. You know, people will still be viewing this three, four months from now, and we're going to update it. I think the science is going to be updated in its mass tort when everyone gets on the same page, but it's so early that it, they haven't created an MDL yet. Haven't created an MDL, and I know when I'm looking at this, they need six months of use, right? They need six mm -hmm. months of use before the warning was on, so before 2022. Correct. Now we've also got what's known as a statute of limitations, right? There's a window in which people have to make their claims. Uh, I can't say a hundred with 100% certainty when that statute starts to run for any individual person right now. I think it's and that's something we discussed this morning because there's many different outlooks on this. Several different lawyers who are approaching this case have different outlooks and how, or at least different ways they're handling this now. Yeah, because literally the standard usually is that the statute of limitations runs from when you knew or should have known you were injured as a result of an incident. So let's Correct. say an auto accident. Well, it's usually pretty clear. You you know when you got in the accident and you start hurt it start hurting. That's that's when you should have known you were injured in the accident. Well, when it mm -hmm. comes to a dangerous drug like this, if you were taking Suboxone in 2015 and your teeth started to rot, you knew you had rotten teeth, but did you have a reason to know it was related to the Suboxone, right? Or did that not happen until 2022? Right now, I've seen a split amongst attorneys where some are saying the date of injury is when the uh, statute of limitations begins to run, while another group are saying the statute begins to run on the date the warning was put on the label. What I can tell you is anybody who is listening to this that thinks they may have a Suboxone claim, uh, like tomorrow was too late to reach out. We don't know when these statutes are going to run, but literally claims are dropping off by the day. So if someone wants to make a claim, now is the time. Don't wait. Correct. Don't call. Mm -hmm. The earlier you get in, the more likely you are to have a successful claim. Yeah, I think there'll be uniformity in how the lawyers are going to handle I shouldn't say I think. I know there's going to be uniformity over the next probably six weeks. The JPML meets on January 25th. You imagine a steering committee will be selected by late February in this mass tour, which is generally it's common theme is within a month. You're going to see that. So hopefully we can have this. We can do an update on this issue over the next six weeks. Okay, so use some acronyms there. JPML and a, and then you talked about a steering committee for people who are not haven't listened to a sure. lot of our podcast. I did mention yes. what JPML was earlier. So it's a joint panel on multi district litigation. These are a group of federal judges that meet usually every quarter to go over selected, um, I wouldn't even call it mass torts, just selected lawsuits have been filed in federal courts where there's an attempt, there's a motion from plaintiff counsel to consolidate the lawsuits all before one jurisdiction and one judge. So that's what the JPML does, and they ferret out those issues. And on occasion, they also decide that it doesn't warrant a, you know, it being an MDL. This one is likely going to be an MDL for a variety of reasons. And then, you know the whole purpose of creating MDL is to coordinate and streamline discovery so that there's common discovery for common factual issues. The plaintiff steering committee is a group of lawyers on the plaintiff side that are serving like almost an executive leadership for this mass tort. These are the lawyers who are going to be selected that are going to either try the cases, maybe sit in um, a scientific advisory role where there's going to be within the steering committee is usually a scientific committee that uh, ferrets out the scientific issues that has to get it past what's called Daubert. Daubert is a standard in federal court where we have to qualify experts and, you know, based on their methodology and how they arrived at their uh, determinations, we are ferreting them out whether they qualify and should be, you know, admissible before a federal court. Is that the best way of saying that, Stan? Yeah. Yeah. Basically, whether the science, the Daubert hearing, I say, does the science meet the standard 
of being reliable enough to be presented to a jury? Or is it just, you know, bogus science that the judge should cut out on her own and never let a jury see it? That's the big hurdle. Like acetaminophen autism. We just went, you know, I was there in uh, December 7th in New York. And what the judge ultimately determined was that the plaintiff uh, steering committee or the plaintiff lawyers cherry picked which studies they were going to present and willfully skipped other studies that did not show the same um, adverse events. And as a result, uh, they didn't qualify and get past Daubert. While I have a bone to pick with the judge and I think the judge made a bad decision, that is ultimately a decision we have to live by. And that is the destruction of that MDL, that Tylenol autism MDL is going the hell in a handbasket very quickly. And those cases are now going to be filed in the state courts, but there's not going to be a federal lawsuit for that going forward. And that's, you know, but also in this in the plaintiff steering committee, we also have a group of lawyers who are selected to try what's called the bellwether trials. And in any mass tort, what winds up happening is a group of six to 12, you know, lawsuits that fit a certain um, paradigm of factual matters are picked. And those are like a sampling to see what a jury would do with the same common if the same common facts and evidence was presented in front of them. These are real trials. And after we re- obtain those results and verdicts, or defense verdicts or plaintiff verdicts, we have an idea, the plaintiff and defense side both, of what these cases are going to look like going forward because you can't try 30,000 cases. And at that point, they decide whether they want to settle or go forward and try more cases. And that's how we start to whittle down a, a settlement. Yeah, you start to come to those values. When I was mentioning that fifty mm-hmm. to 150000 those are really just pie-in-the-sky numbers people are picking out right now, right? There's Correct. been no jury, no determination has been made. These are just estimations nope. by attorneys that are out there looking at this. And they may be right, they may be wrong. I mean, to wit, I don't know of any um, Suboxone tooth decay lawsuits that have been tried to verdict. No. I don't think any have. I-, I don't believe they have, at least the last I looked at. Yeah, and to wit, I think the first one that was actually even uh, filed was uh, this year. So now there's a group of about 40 of these lawsuits that are all in different districts throughout the United States. Um, and eventually, we believe they're going to be consolidated over the next few weeks. What would be the process of joining an MDL? If someone has used Suboxone, they've got tooth decay, they believe they are, you know, may have a claim, what, I mean, what do they do? I mean, they can go online and research uh, lawyers that are handling Suboxone claims. You know, be very careful. Of the universe of mass tort lawyers out there, a lot of lawyers are nothing more than aggregators, meaning they're just signing these cases up and saying to other law firms, we're handling it ourselves at, at Dolman Russo, which is our mass tort firm within Dolman Law Group. You know, if anybody wants to reach out to me, feel free to just drop me a line at Matt, M-A-T-T, at DolmanLaw.com. That's Matt at D like in David, O-L-M-A-N-L-A-W.com. Everything remains confidential. And, um, you know, if it meets the criteria... I'm going to reach out to you. If it if we're it's questionable, our intake team or myself we're going to reach out to you. So we're very accessible and we're we're happy to help. And this is we're very much involved in this mass tort, and uh, I look forward to helping out a lot of good people who have uh, suffered a very obvious harm that could have been avoided if Nvidia Inc. did not rush this to market. You know, as a result of uh, the tablets itself, then running out. You know, the patent was going to run out, and they're going to face generic competition. Yeah, and if you want to know some more details, we've kind of brushed on a lot of the stuff here, and I think we'll get into a bit more, but Lawsuit Legal News is a great source for updated information on the suits themselves. If you're not really Correct. ready to make a claim, you're not there, don't know whether you should call an attorney or not yet, it's a great source to keep you updated on what's happening, what's changing. No, I, I, this it's is- updated weekly, so Lawsuit Legal News is our uh, mass tort website. Um, and it's on a host of different mass torts and projects that are out there. And we update this on a daily basis. There's also dolmanlaw.com, which is our law firm website, D-O-L-M-A-N-L-A-W.com. And on there, if you could just research Dolman Law Suboxone, um, we show up usually pretty close to the top of the search engines. But uh, you'll find our website. You'll find the actual page within our website. Or you can go to the main menu on our homepage, and there will be a, you know, a tab for Suboxone Lawsuit. That is also updated at least weekly and often daily. So, and I, we've talked about this, but just because it's part of the podcast, mm-hmm. how come Suboxone, let's say a Suboxone lawsuit, I, I hadn't heard about this till you told me. Like there's not any commercials out there. It's, you know, how come there's not more information about this Suboxone claims and do you expect that to change? I do. And I'm going to juxtapose this against like Camp Lejeune, for instance. When Camp Lejeune came out, everyone knows what Camp Lejeune is based on the PACT Act signed into effect on August 19th, 2022 by President Biden. We have now afforded uh, benefits 
and well, these are being fought out by you know the uh, Department of Defense, United States Navy's tort claims unit. But eventually, benefits will be paid out to service members um, who served at Camp Lejeune, which is actually a Marine base. And um, you know, they, there was contaminants in the water in Camp Lejeune. That was an obvious mass tort. Lawyers were lining up right from the very beginning. We compare it to like acetaminophen and autism. Lawyers waited that one out. You didn't see a whole lot of advertising until we got closer to the Daubert hearings because everyone sat out and we were waiting to see, is this actually going to be a meritable mass tort? I think Suboxx will fall in the middle. I don't think you're going to be seeing any advertising, at least for six to eight weeks. Once we get past uh, the JPML hearing on January 25th and a plaintiff's steering committee is created in probably mid to late February, and now we're seeing a bunch of other mass torts start to either die off or at least the advertising is, like Camp Lejeune, those cases have been found. There's very few individuals out there who served at Marine Corps Base Camp Lejeune in South Carolina that have not filed a claim or their family members have not filed a claim. They knew about this. The advertising was so hot and heavy. It was so saturated that you know about this. And if you were a claimant, you've already been found. There's not a lot of other mass tour products out there right now. So I think that you will start to see um, advertising heat up over the spring, especially as, you know, there's a convention for mass tort lawyers called Mass Torts Made Perfect. They have out in Vegas every October and April. And uh, you'll see a host of uh, mass tort vendors that will be pushing Suboxone starting in probably late March. They'll start sending out the newsletters that we hope to see in April. And uh, this is a new project we're going to be telling you about. So you'll see some generic advertising come on. When I say generic, maybe not specific to a law firm, but a generic ad with a number. And it's a lead generation company. It's looking to sell those leads to lawyers. So you'll start seeing more and more of this as time goes on. I don't think this is going to be a huge mass tort for another year. Well, and, and if you, that was a, a short example uh, explanation as I could make of uh, or be as concise as possible there. It was and it was almost an accidental segue into what I wanted to discuss next. Okay, you mentioned these ads that come up with a sort of innocuous number and if you're not sure. I mean even if you are a sophisticated consumer watching these ads, you would think this is an attorney advertising for you to call them and you're going to call this number and you're going to get in touch with this attorney and you're going to be signed up for a suit. Really, right. what a lot of these are just lead generation companies. They're not attorneys. Uh, they mm-hmm. put these ads out there to make it look like they're attorneys. You call in, you sign up with them, but you're not really signing up with them. You're signing up with someone they're selling the lead to or selling the case to, so to speak, right? And these, these yeah. law firms are paying the lead gen company. So, and often they have a rotation of lawyers that are they're paying in five different firms and they just ferret it out by the rotation. Yeah. So if you're someone who really, you know, doesn't really care, just wants to be in the suit, it's fine to call whoever. You will get to an attorney. Your claim will probably get into the NDL mm-hmm. in some way, shape, or form. But if you're really looking at something and you think you see something on the website or a certain ad appeals to you, or you think there's something about that specific person. Make sure you're responding. I always recommend sign up directly with an attorney. All right, there's no reason for you to have a middleman out there, you know, deciding which attorney you go with. Go do your own research, right? You could go to Dolman Law and decide these people are awful, right? You may not want them. You could go to Dolman Law, not as I would think you would. You think you'd probably find that we're great, right? But you're researching the person who's handling your case. You're not researching a lead gen company. You're looking at the real attorney. So I always encourage people to get out there. Look at the websites for the people that will be handling the case, not just mm-hmm. the people referring the case to an attorney for you. Correct. So we, we could do a whole podcast, literally, on um, the cesspool that is attorney advertising and even worse, lead generation. And I hate to paint with one broad brush. There's some good lead generation companies out there. And there's plenty of great law firms out there. Not every law firm has a pro- we have an issue with, but... The lead generation, I will just at least tackle that in a, in a quick and concise manner in saying that um, it is accessible. Even if you look at the Camp Lejeune advertisers, they make it seem much more simple than it really is. It's often, you know, it's a smoke and mirrors presentation where they make the claim seem much easier and more fruitful than it may be. They create unfair expectations. That's why I'd be very careful of who you sign up with. And all that qualifies, you know, the law firm to participate is they just paid a lead generation company. And it's not like the lead generation company is vetting which law firms are going to work with. It's whoever presents him with money that month. And that's literally the only qualification, which is why I'd be very hesitant to sign up through a lead gen company, and I would opt to go with a law firm, let alone, and we keep hearing more and more about this, the, the um, unsavory tactics that many of these lead generation companies utilize to sign up clients, including high-pressure sales tactics. So I would just deal directly with a law firm. 
Um, and I would, if you're going to research, for instance, a boxing or Ozempic, which is another mass tort out there right now, which causes what's known as stomach paralysis, I would look to see which law firms are actually handling these cases and call up the law firm and say, are you handling this case? Do you intend to handle it directly? Or are you referring the case out to another law firm? Which, by the way, does not make the law, it doesn't, I'm trying to think of the best way of saying this, but that doesn't give me a bad impression of the law firm. Some law firms are nothing more than aggregators, or they pick and choose which products they're going to handle in-house. And some We can only handle a couple in-house. We even refer out some of the mass towards to other law firms. Nothing wrong with that, but at least you will know who's going to be your handling lawyer. I guess that's the best way of saying that. Yeah, it's not just a random pick. And no matter who it is, okay, you got to mm-hmm. understand if, if a lead generation company refers this case out, they're out. Right. Yes. All they've got to do is get the check, put it in their pocket, and never see it again. Even if, if you sign up with an attorney, okay, that's then partnering with another attorney to handle the cases, as we sometimes do, we're still on the hook, right? We're still your attorney, right? We're still responsible to you to make sure things happen. You go with a lead gen company, that same level of responsibility isn't out there. My own personal pet peeve on this is, as attorneys, okay, what we're able to do is is regulated by the bar, right? I, mm-hmm. I can only advertise, I can only say certain things because the bar will limit my ability to say these things. And if I go beyond what the bar allows me to do, they can take my license to practice law. Lead gen companies based in Nevada advertising in Florida don't have to worry about that. No, they're not, there's no oversight. Not subject to the same limitations. You know, not subject nope. to the same penalties. So the stuff, if you're seeing something and the promises seem unrealistic, they may be. Usually are. So if you are at home right now and you're interested in this boxing claim, again, feel free to drop me a line at Matt, M-A-T-T, at Dolman Law, D like and David, O-L-M-A-N-L-A-W dot com, or uh, call us anytime, 727-451-6900. We're handling cases all over the country. It doesn't matter where you are. And we're, uh, we remain ready, willing, and able to assist you in your suboxone claim. Yeah, and, you know, once again, the basic idea here is we went from a Suboxone pill to a Suboxone strip because it delivered the medication much quicker. Didn't seem like people picked up the fact that when you're dissolving this strip, it dissolves right onto your gum and teeth and therefore drops acid almost right onto your gum and teeth, and it seems that this is causing massive tooth decay. So that's exactly it. It's not just Suboxone. It's the Suboxone sublingual strips that really made the tooth decay issue bad. Well said. Yeah. Just just to sum it up, because we kind of got on some tangents out there. Well, thank you again, Stan, for joining me for another episode of David and Goliath Podcast. I wish everyone a great day. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Reach out to us if you ever need anything. This episode of David versus Goliath is over, but your journey is just getting started. To share your story with us, visit dolmanlaw.com. That's D-O-L-M-A-N law.com. Or call 866-965-6242. The insights and views presented in David vs. Goliath are for general information purposes only and should not be taken as legal advice for any individual case or situation. The information presented is not a substitute for consulting with an attorney, nor does tuning into this podcast constitute an attorney-client relationship of any kind. Any case result information provided on any portion of this podcast should not be understood as a promise of any particular result in a future case. Dolman Law Group. Big firm results. Small firm personal attention.